Well, welcome everybody to uh, today's seminar. I'm really excited. I'm honored to be chairing um, today. We have three speakers talking about um, EDI and inclusive, inclusivity. Um, but before we start, I believe uh, Ellen Rumpel, the um, chair of the ad hoc um, committee for EDI and the IGS would like to say a few words. All right, well, thank you. Um... And I, I'm actually not the chair. I, I, I should uh, I should say um, uh, our committee was formed back in 2020, and Nana Carlson is the chair of the committee, um, and the other members you can see listed down here at the bottom of the screen. Um, so council formed our committee um, to undergo actions on uh, diversity and inclusivity, and we came up with a report that we gave to council recently. Um, that included input from a lot of responses that we got from Global Seminar Series participants. Um, and this is uh, one sort of emblematic um, uh, response, that there's, there's a willingness from our community to, to evolve and change, um, but there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and the recommendations our committee made, I'm just going to quickly advertise, um, they involve changes to our honors and awards practice. Um, to the journals that we publish, um, to involvement of early career researchers in IGS activities, and more broadly, just in enhancing the diversity of our membership. Um, so those actions are all under discussion by council, so I don't have a lot of announcements that I can make because I'm not on council and, and they're, they're going through this. Um, but they are formulating plans for a new standing committee, so please, um, you know, stay, stay uh, on cryo list and and listening because uh, you can expect announcements about this sort of thing going forward. And it does require work from our community, um, and um, and so committee involvement is always appreciated. Um, and Hesser did give me a, a few notes on on things that the publications committee uh, has. Uh, has been doing in the last several years. Um, so I just wanted to summarize those. Um, the editorial board composition has been broadened. Editors um, have ongoing mentoring um, and EDI training that's planned. Um, first author indications of early career researchers um, has been implemented. So that's important for the Graham Cogley Award, um, which is, is handled that way, or is, goes to, um, early career researchers. Um, and a number of other changes have taken place, including involving more early career researchers as reviewers um, and trying to improve on the on just general professionalism and respect in the review process um, by encouraging reviewers to reveal their names, um, not just remain anonymous, um, and, and a few other steps like that. Um, so there's there's a lot of words here, and I don't want to take up a lot of your time, um, but um, I, I would encourage you to 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 look into um, these other general guidelines, um, and again, just to to pay attention to announcements from the IGS because we can expect many more to be forthcoming. Um, and with that, I'll I'll, I'll stop there and uh, and leave it back to. Um, to the rest of the presentations. Okay, perfect. Thank you for that, Ellen. Uh, and with that, we are over to our first speaker, who is Helen Fricker. Um, I'm not going to introduce you uh, a lot here because I think everybody knows you anyway, but um, Helen is a professor at Scripps Institution of Oce Oceanography at the University of California. And Helen was actually the first one to give a seminar talk, which is a bit more than two years ago. Uh, for the IGS seminar. And with that, um, over to you, Helen. Thanks, Rebecca. Yeah, I was just uh, chatting with Fiamma about that, that um, this seminar series was started by TV right during COVID, the first COVID lockdown. Um, and yeah, some of you will remember that I gave a rerun of my NIE lecture in, I think it was, it was March or April uh, 2020. So thanks for having me again, Tavi, and thanks for everything you do to keep these seminars going, like almost every single week during COVID. It's, it's been really amazing to bring the community together like this. So this is a talk that I um, gave at AGU 
um, in December. Um, I've updated it a little bit, but uh, hopefully you won't mind that I didn't completely update it. And I even kept the slides at the bottom saying AGU. Um, and uh, at that time, it was a, it was a, a discussion section in the AGU cryosphere um, uh, section. And I actually did, uh, prepared these slides in collaboration with Ginny Catania. Um, and I think Ginny's here as well. Um, and I'm just grateful to her for helping me put this talk together. So what the sort of idea of the talk is um, how to sort of how we can all get behind the idea of building a better cryosphere community for everybody. This isn't just about like making it better for for um, for, for just a few people. It's actually going to make it better for everybody. Like but this is what I want to sort of get the message across about today. Um, so um, we'll with that. We all know this, um, that our field of cryosphere, you know, what, whether we're working on um, sea ice or glaciers or ice sheets or any sort of aspect is, has become a real um, sort of urgent societal issue. Um, understanding and predicting the changes in the cryosphere is, is very relevant um, for policy and things like um, you know, sea level rise and changing um, conditions, changing climate conditions. And what that means is that we, are becoming sort of real figures and, and very prominent sort of in the media. Um, and quite often you'll end up seeing a colleague like on the front page of like The Observer, for example. Uh, my mum, who's in the audience today, sent me this photograph many years ago of um, Maddie Rosevere, who um, at that time was a PhD student in Hobart. And there she is on the front page of The Observer. Um, for those of you who don't know, that's a, 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 the, it, in the UK. Um, and there's Maddie, and this is like, um, you know, someone I know that happens to be there. So this is the kind of thing that happens to us now, like we see our colleagues there. And this is because our field has become so relevant to society that we really are now um, there for, um, you know, the, the, out there in the media and, and getting our message out. So we all know this, but this is just a sort of general thing that climate change is ampli amplified at the poles through positive, we know about the feedbacks. And we also know that this is going to accelerate, which means that we are going to remain like in the public eye, like the, um, the media and um, sort of what the work that we do becomes more and more relevant as time goes on, as these, as these issues um, accelerate. And so over on the left, the Arctic sea ice shrinking, we know about the albedo feedback, um, and how um, this is in the, the changes in the, um, the extent of the sea ice is affecting the global albedo and also freshwater um, export. And then over on the right, the land ice um, is shrinking as well. And this is having major implications for sea level. And so the point is that these things are having an effect um, all over the world. Um, and some communities which um, are far away from the polar regions are also being affected. So um, the sea level rise and the Arctic sea ice and the changing um, sort of ramifications or the ramifications of, of the changing cryosphere has far reaching impacts across the world to communities who, who, who probably don't know much about the cryosphere because they don't live near it and don't study it. Um, and so this means that our our message is really important for people all around the world um, and we need to um, and this is kind of basically what this means is we kind of have a um, an obligation our community our cryosphere community has a sort of social obligation because our science is becoming more relevant to broad sectors of humanity we really do have a responsibility to deliver what we know our information and increase our understanding outside of our little echo chamber like we can give seminars here and we all understand and we all sort of major we know the jargon and everything but but how about like getting that message out to policymakers to other people to people who don't study what we they're not in our in our little kind of silo so how can we do that and there are many um sort of different ways um to do this and i've just got a, a, a scattering of sort of personal figures here this is um Cecile, who was at cop um, this is three years ago at cop in madrid talking in the cryosphere booth about sea level rise and impacts of sea level rise um, this is myself with uh, Dr. Ramanathan from uh, at Scripps, and we were in the San Diego City Council talking about sea level rise in terms of like what San Diego might look like in the future. Uh, this is a climate march um, in Bath. Um, and so this is kind of uh, where we are. I mean, we are very privileged. And this is a quote here at the bottom from Jane Levchenko. 
um, who um, very wisely said at the end of the 90s, we're privileged to be able to indulge our passions for science and simultaneously provide something useful to society. This is a real privilege that we have, but with that privilege comes a serious responsibility. In other words, we are sort of the stewards of this information and we need to not just keep that information to ourselves. We're not gatekeepers. We, we are there, we've learned, we've, we've been trained, but we need to get that message out. Um, and this is a very interesting, um, at the bottom here, there's a very interesting article, if you're interested, that was uh, recently published in Environmental Research Letters, basically reflecting back over the last few decades, um, has the social contract been realized or not? I strongly encourage you to read that. Um, so there's very different ways that we can get this, uh, you know, reach the public and, and get uh, the message out, but also to decision makers and to policy makers. And this is just a couple of examples here, um, three sort of independently written articles um, all around about the same time, actually, within the few uh, few months, Walid Abdelati, um, myself and Fiamma Stranio, and then Ginny Catania, um, co-author of this talk, all three, all, uh, three sets of people um, writing uh, op-eds for The Hill, which is a, um, a magazine um, uh, that uh, goes out in Washington, DC. So this is just one way of getting the message out, but to reach sort of policy uh, decision makers and how we can sort of get the information outside of our little, uh, well, not little, but our echo chamber here, where we all understand the science and, and what's going on. Um, so we have big challenges ahead in understanding how the cryosphere will change. The cryosphere is inherently interdisciplinary. The cryosphere, you know, it's part of the Earth system. It interacts uh, through the carbon cycle, the energy cycle, the water cycle. We need to be able to understand all of these things. It's not just one little part of the cryosphere that we need to understand. We need to understand how it interacts across um, the Earth system because the cryosphere is delicately sort of within and uh, interactions and feedbacks. Um, between all different elements of the Earth system. So this means that we need to move outside of our disciplinary boundaries, and we need to understand different aspects of Earth science as well to see how our piece fits in with that. So we need to be thinking in a broad sort of disciplinary sense as we understand the cryosphere. Um, so one thing we need to do to do this is we need to change the status quo within our field. So our field being cryosphere, and clearly I've chosen a very sort of Antarctic centric photograph here because as most of you know, my main research area has, has been and, and um, generally has is Antarctica and the ice sheets. Um, and so we need to address the status quo within our field by addressing this existing power structure that we have and the lack of diversity. We have a real problem in our field that there is um, a lack of diversity. Our pop the population of people who does Antarctic and cryosphere science does not look like the, the normal population. It doesn't, it's not represented proportionally. Um, and this is a very nice article in the uh, conversation from about a year ago um, by Meredith Nash and others. Um, white continent, white blokes, why Antarctic research needs to shed its exclusionary past. Um, and so you can see, I mean, this is a, this is a very sort of a classic picture of the Antarctic explorer. And if you ask, you know, lots of like a kid in the kindergarten class, what does what does an Antarctic explorer look like? They would probably um, paint a picture of, of, a, of a white man. Um, and this is what we need to change. There's a lack of diversity in our field. And I think we all know this. It's getting much better. There's no question there, but we have a long way to go. But what I want to do today for the rest of my time here is explain to you why it's important. Um, because I think that some of that has been a bit lost on people, like, why are we doing this? Are we just trying to tick this, like, DEI, JEDI, whatever you want to call it, box, um, and, you know, do the right thing? There's way, way deeper than that, and there's a lot of work that we need to do to get there, but I want to kind of um, explain to you why it's so important. So I'm going to give you three reasons. Um, so here's the first reason. These are the benefits of increasing diversity and how they're going to be wide reaching in our field, not just in our field, but also sort of outside our field and into, this, like into the rest of the earth sciences. So the first one is that having a diverse group of people provides new and different ways of looking at problems that is going to improve and innovate our science and lead to better scientific outcomes. This is being tried like time and time again, research has shown that if you have a more diverse group, a team of people, you're going to enhance your creativity, your solutions will be more acceptable and more likely to be implemented if they're conceived by a group with broad life experiences. 
And this is not, I mean, these, some of these figures are sort of more from, uh, these schematics are more from uh, industry and the corporate world, but they translate pretty well to academia as well. Um, so having employees from a different background opens up a variety of perspectives and ideas and ends up with better outcomes. Who doesn't want that? The second one, um, if we increase diversity and we're able to sort of make our community look a lot more like the, uh, the general population, that is going to improve our ability to capture the attention of the general public and lawmakers. The thing is that people identify with people who look like them, right? And so if you only have one sort of aspect of, of uh, so one sector of society represented in prior sciences, you're gonna miss a whole swath of people who might listen, but they are not going to. Um, and so if you want to raise the visibility of our field, which we, I think we really can all agree that we're underfunded um, for what we're trying to do here and understanding things like, uh, you know, ice sheets and sea level and, and how things are gonna change and sea ice and all these things, we, we need more funding. We're not getting much funding. I mean, the average um, amount of money that's spent on Halloween in the US is $10 billion. And I mean, the NSF budget is less than that. So, you know, it's kind of crazy how little money gets put into our field. Um, but if we raise the visibility of our field, in the long run, where we will get there is we'll get enhanced appreciation of cryosphere science and hopefully more funding, more job opportunities, just more exposure. And it's definitely something that we all want, right? So we want one and we want two. Now, the third one is also super important because this is basically where what we want. We want bright young people working in our field, right? Who doesn't want that? We want exciting teams. We want like, energy. We want new sort of ideas to come in. And those people want to work in a welcoming, like a very sort of um, broad community where all ideas and all races and all genders are accepted. And this is really important. Workplace happiness will be increased if you have a diverse team. It's been shown that um, teams are generally happier if the teams are more diverse. Um, and so if you want to attract the best and the brightest, then this is how we need to do it. And it's just as simple as that. So one, two, three, who doesn't want all three of those? This is going to be so much better for our whole community if we can embrace these ideas. Um, I think there's been a little bit of concern that oh, you know, the pie is only so big. And, and if we sort of like open up, then I'm still going to only get, I'll have less pie. No, the pie will actually grow. That's the point. Um, so it's, how can we do this? I think hopefully I've convinced you that we need to do this. And there are many ways that we can do this. And Alan gave a great list at the beginning. Um, and this is sort of tailored um, to, you know, the, the cryosphere community in terms of AGU, but it, it pertains to IGS as well. Many of you have heard of URGE. Um, the PI for URGE is, is here at Scripps, Vashan Wright. Um, it's unlearning racism in geoscience. Um, this is the cryo community. Um, this is advanced geo, which has all sorts of information about um, increasing diversity and anti-bullying and um, codes of conduct and that kind of thing. Um, picture a scientist. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is if you're sitting here listening to me going, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never experienced this. Well, I really want you to watch that film. I think there is not a single person that would watch that film and walk away going, there's a problem. Like, uh, like not, not going, there's a problem. And there is a problem and there's a big problem. And every person who watches that film will see what the problem is. And I really would like you to watch it. And if you don't have a copy of it, I can send you one. Um, so this is a list here of what we can do. Um, there's a whole list here. I won't go through them all, but um, you know, you've all heard about you know, implicit bias training and all this stuff. This is why it's so important. It's really important. So listen up when you hear about it in your institution, anytime there's an opportunity, listen up and take part because it's super important. Um, okay, I think I might be running out of time. Um, so I'm going to say this was for AGU, like I said, but we can do this in IGS as well. How can we incre increase diversity in IGS? Okay, I put the little logo there to prove that I did slightly update the slides. Um, we can strive for gender balance in oral sessions. Why shouldn't there be more women speaking than men? It's been the other way around for so long. It doesn't, that, that's completely fine. Um, encourage women and minorities to convene sessions, like get up there on the stage. This is a great um, sort of picture here when this was a fantastic uh, thing from an in-person AGU about three years ago when Anna 
uh, Hogg was um, was convening, and then with Tish Yeager was was talking, and it was fantastic. They both did a tremendous job. This has to happen like all the time. Uh, we need women and minorities on committees. We need women and minorities to ask for a talk. Don't go for the poster option. Just ask for a talk and get yourself up there. Um, we need, uh, the, this is one other thing from, this is more from AGU, but canvassing committees to increase diversity in nomination pools for AGU awards and honors. And also, well, IGS as well, but also recognize teamwork. This is a great a graphic I got from Fiamma. Um, and so no longer are we sort of like, trying to like get be the first one to climb a mountain we're actually all trying to climb the mountain together and the teams are really important uh broaden the criteria so that we can recognize that as well um i think i might skip over this a bit because i sort of am a bit out of time this is really talking about awards and just to show you in the data that there are many many much less women getting these awards the year i became an agu fellow which i'll show you in a second there were only 10 women out of 61 total fellows which is a really dire number and this was to draw attention to the fact that we've been talking about this this is in eos since the year i started my phd i mean this is pretty depressing really um, but we have to do better like so you know you guys probably all know that um with the agu cryo session last section last year we didn't nominate any fellows that was a really controversial decision we got a lot of support and a lot of backlash for that but what it did do is it opened up a conversation so we're now talking about it which we haven't really done before. So it shocked the system, whether it was a good or bad thing, it definitely did something. And I think that we're gonna see some real change. Um, so here's some things that you can do. Take time to nominate worthy women as well, IGS awardees, recruit women onto these committees as well. Um, increase the visibility of women within the, a, this is IGS. Um, the single most important component for keeping women in the professional ranks of science is for them to observe other women scientists in their fields who they can look up to, right? Senior women for incoming women to identify with. Um, I probably haven't got time for my story about that. So I will just jump. Um, so this isn't like the first thing, the, you know, there's lots of evidence of, of women being brilliant and amazing in polar science. And this is a, a graphic from um, a talk, the first talk I gave in the IGS seminar, um, which is basically showing all the features of Antarctica named after women, but you can also see some very famous polar women here. Um, we have Ginny right here, my co-author, Christina Holbe, Robin Bell, Jane Francis, Kelly Faulkner, uh, Julie Palais down there. Um, oh, this is me as well. <laughs> um, and you know, this is this things are things are definitely getting better. Um, and this was from Ginny today. She looked up glaciologists on Google, and this is the images that popped up. So this is pretty heartening. I think we are making progress. Um, but we really hope that with this, you know, with this discussion today and moving on forwards, we hope that the entire IGS will come together around a better, a more inclusive vision of our future. And I hope I've explained to you today why that's so important for everybody. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Helen. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Tavia has just put in the chat that actually in the IGS seminar, the 50% um, of the speakers were uh, women, which is really nice, or almost, yeah, awesome. so really nice, thank you. Um, uh, next one, we have Julia Wellner. Julia is um, part of the Department of Earth and Atmospheric Science at University of Houston, and she's also a PI for the THOR project, uh, THOR team of the THOR team of th the Thwaites project, and I think you're going to talk about the efforts uh, the whole team has been taking um, towards the idea is that how you call it yes it is now do you see my slides yeah looks good okay great so yes i am going to briefly talk about inclusion diversity equity and accessibility efforts that the weights collaboration team has been working on like helen i gave this talk at agu and i think tavi is also going to present um, her AGU talk in just a moment. And so we're all following up on uh, discussions that started in a um, cryosphere town hall at AGU that was put together to address um, a whole range of community development questions there. I also made just very minor changes to this presentation. But it's also, I think, different than the ones before me and after me, because it's really 
just a small scale effort. I'm just going to talk about the efforts of the Thwaites collaboration team. And so it's really just one community that is working on um, efforts to improve the culture and access to our work. At the same time, while it's just one project, it's a big project. Um, and so hopefully we've got some lessons to share. And I'm gonna introduce the team in just a minute. I'm gonna start with what is the IGS team or the IGS project. This is a figure that many of you um, might be um, quite familiar with, um, showing all the different ways that we might study um, an ice sheet that's grounded in the ocean and then has an ice shelf out in front of it. So Thwaites Glacier in West Antarctica is the focus of many different studies. And the Thwaites Glacier collaboration, which is primarily between the US and the UK, includes eight different scientific teams that are working on the bed of the glacier. They are working from onshore geology. It includes oceanography. It includes marine geology, which is where I work. It includes modeling and cal of calving processes, et cetera. So it's an integrated approach with eight individual teams trying to all study different parts of Thwaites Glacier at the same time. We can look at um, the project in another way. Here we see it, um, how each of the projects are supposed to fit together. And so there's um, the marine geology and the onshore geology on one side, a range of projects that are studying um, different components of the ice itself. And then all of us are feeding into modeling projects. And then the goal is that those feed into policy, both local and IPCC type work. What doesn't fit on this diagram is that each of us, each of these individual teams has come together to build what we call the IDEA um, team to help improve our community. So the people that are working on that, let me just change. Oh. Um, so from the beginning, we've always tried to work on community building within the Thor project itself. Um, we've done a whole range of sort of great but typical outreach efforts. We've had a polar track teacher embedded in our field work. We have a whole range of grad and undergrad students. We've had media, social media, including here is one of our Instagram stories um, explaining how we do some of our field work. Each of us are involved in a range of outreach programs on our own campuses, etc. But none of those are directly addressing how we work within our own community. And to do that, we have um, our IDEA Council, formerly called JEDI and now changed to IDEA. This is a at least partial list of the representatives that are volunteering from each of the projects. What I'd like to call your attention to here is that many of the people that are working actively in our group are actually from the science management office. So we have engagement and buy-in, not just from individual scientists and the projects, but from the office, as well as from the US Antarctic Program logistics teams. And we have NSF funding to hire a consultant. We have a DEI consultant, Leilani Henry, working with us to guide our community on developing um, better ways to work together and improve how we're engaging with a range of um, different communities. So what I'm gonna do now is show you a little bit of how we work, um, lots of Zoom meetings as uh, we are right now, and quickly, how have we succeeded and how have we maybe hit some problems? Um, well, to start with, I think that we had several benefits as we formed this group. We were already international. We were already interdisciplinary. Um, each of our teams included both um, lead PIs and 
um, more junior co-PIs as well as students and postdocs and sometimes undergrads. Um, we came from a range of backgrounds with a range of career goals, especially if you include um, people like those representing USAP logistics. In addition, this group benefited from having the momentum of NSF and NERC, the UK equivalent, um, engaged and supporting our efforts. We founded this group um, about two years ago and did so with um, the backing of our funding agencies, allowing us to get off the ground really quickly. So what do we think anyway has gone well with these efforts? Um, well, we've had lots and lots of open-ended discussions. Sometimes it's been extraordinary to think how much time we've spent on Zoom, um, but we've set up a bi-weekly meeting um, so that there's always a place to come and discuss DEI-related issues. Um, we've also implemented a range of training sessions for all of the Thwaites Glacier collaboration teams. That includes about 150 people. Um, you know, depending on how we count or which day we count, that number might vary a little bit. But on the order of 150 scientists are working on this Thwaites Glacier collaboration. And our group of about 20 people has implemented a range of sessions and discussions where we have discussed uh, gender, we have discussed race, um, we have discussed sexual orientation, and general issues of inclusion. And we've approached this with the idea that simply coming together and talking is a good step, but we've also had a trained leader to manage many of these discussions so that they don't go astray as they might otherwise. Um, our consultant Leilani has led inclusive um, leadership training for the project PIs. We've undergone a basically mandatory leadership training about how to develop inclusive communities. And um, we have a document developed by um, several of our community members, including Aaron Pettit, who I think is here, a development of shared community norms, where that is written down and it's discussed and it's shared at each meeting. Um, one of our new efforts um, for our upcoming um, collaborative meeting, we have a new effort at ways to make sure DEI is included in each and every presentation. And in order to do this, we have given an extension of time for all science talks for anybody who says they will include DEI topics. What that means is that it's not set aside. DEI is not going to be moved off to its own session and its own time period where somebody might not remember to come. But it's also not pulling time out of your science presentation. So it's a little bit hard in scheduling. Um, but anyone who says they will include DEI in their talk is going to be allowed a few extra minutes to do what they can in their presentation. Um, finally, um, our group, especially Johnny Kingslake, has led the development of a best practices document for field work, specifically for Antarctic field work. And this was shared as part of a training for all teams going into the field. Um, we had three groups in the field this year, including um, our, another cruise. Um, this worked and didn't work in some ways. So that's why it's uh, halfway between our what's gone well and what are our problems slides. What are our barriers to progress in um, trying to implement these improvements to our community? One is without a doubt, simply the demands on our time. Um, this is essentially volunteer work for every one of us. 
And that means that we are um, trying to do it on top of an already heavy workload. We encourage um, our own universities or institutes or NSF or AGU or IGS to make this work part of um, reviews, promotions, and awards. Make sure that the people who are doing this hard work are recognized. Um, a second barrier um, is that sometimes we may be talking in an echo chamber. As long as this work remains voluntary, um, the people who choose to engage in it are maybe the people who are already doing it themselves and we need to continue to reach out to broader and broader audiences to make sure everybody has the tools to improve their research community into a more um, inclusive group. I'm taking um, Helen's presentation at heart and assuming everybody knows that we need to um, build diverse teams. Um, other difficulties are that it's an ad hoc group. You know, we've just built it out of nothing a couple of years ago. Um, and that means we certainly spend a lot of time in spin up and maybe some of that was going in circles a little bit. Um, but we can value that time as community building and getting to know each other as we figured out what to do. And we are a complex community, um, you know, multi multinational, multidisciplinary, multiple career stages, and that does make it hard in some ways. Um, hopefully, we can keep learning from each other. Um, what are we doing next? As a Thwaites team, we will continue to work um, within the Thwaites Glacier Collaboration but we also have made an active decision that we'd like to engage with others in the cryosphere community that are interested in related issues. As such, um, Betsy Sheffield gave a talk at WACE. Um, I did at AGU, TJ Young did at EGU. I'm here today. More broadly, many of our members are in a whole bunch of other groups. Um, I believe including the IGS DEI effort includes some of the same people that are on this group. Um, in addition to having our team um, join other efforts, we invite you to come to some of our discussions. If you're interested, just reach out. We'd love to hear from you. Um, our, my, web, my slides had the web link a few minutes ago. Um, we'd like to share and learn from you as well. Um, so last, um, this is the same slide um, that I started with. I'm repeating it, um, trying to say yes, you know, sometimes the road ahead does look blocked. I hope that we're breaking through bit by bit and making a little progress um, and not simply going in circles as it sometimes feels like we might be. Thank you. and. Um, I look forward to hearing more. Thank you, Julia. I really like your images at the end. They really nicely illustrated um, the situation. <laughs> okay, nice. Thank you. Um, and we're over to our last speaker, who is uh, Tavi Murray from Swansea University and also the initi initiator of um, the seminar. I looked it up. Today should be seminar number 88. So Incredible number. Well done, Tavi. And um, over to you. Okay, thanks, Rebecca. So I'm going to start off with no slides here. Um, as I said on the chat, um, I've actually been very deliberate and have um, tried to ensure uh, over sort of longer periods of time, we have had 50% women, 50% uh, um, men as far um, uh, as is possible uh, in the seminar series. And so that kind of feels really nice. And then today I got an email. I don't know how many of you, you guys did as well. It was from research.com and it came up with some congratulations. You are a scientist number, whatever it was in, um, in, in uh, your field. I clicked on this casually. I had five, you know, five minutes I wanted to spare. And if you want to know what machine learning thinks earth scientists look like, 
click on that link, it's horrifying. In the first 100 Earth scientists um, produced by research.com, as uh, the top 100 in the, uh, in the world, there are two women. So we may feel that we're, we're making progress, but it would seem that we still got a long way to go. So that was just a sort of a, a moment of horror today for me. Um, so I'm going to share my screen now and I'm going to give um, essentially as the other two have the talk that I gave at AGU and uh, I'm hoping through this that I'm going to um, show you all why I'm so enthusiastic about um, the IGS seminar. Um, I gave this talk at a virtual meeting um, of AGU so I, I wasn't there and um, by not flying to uh, New Orleans, I saved myself 2.2 tonnes of CO2 equivalent, um, or about 33% of uh, an average European carbon footprint for the year. And I think that's really important that simply by flying to one meeting, I would have used up 33% of um, what is already a too large carbon footprint for the year. So, so I think there are two big challenges for the cryospheric community. Um, neither of them are, if you like, easy um, and they go hand in hand. And I think the solutions to them actually can come together. So the first one is climate change. Um, and the second one is what we're talking about mostly today. But I think some of the solutions to these things come together. So in US parlance, this is equity, diversity and inclusion. And this quite often has justice in front of it, which also, of course, sits in front of climate change as well. We know the climate things really well. It's our bread and butter business. But I wonder to what extent we feel we, we are really part of this problem as well as part of the solution. So here we are, IPCC 2021, we're going to reach plus one and a half degrees between 2030 and 2052. Um, and after COP26 um, in Glasgow last December, um, the UK's Government Climate Change Committee said following COP26, global temperatures are set to rise by about 2.7 degrees centigrade. Scientists and academics are amongst some of the highest emitters. We fly to meetings, to conferences and on fieldwork. Now clearly for fieldwork it's really difficult to see how we get around that, but we can't ignore the carbon footprint of our big meetings. So ADU in 2019, so the year before, oops sorry, just leaned on my keyboard, um, the year before uh, COVID, um, the participants travelled 285 million kilometres to get to that meeting. Um, in um, the 2020, um, the European Astronomical Society went online instead of having a face-to-face -face meeting and it reduced its carbon footprint by 3,000 times. So huge, um, huge opportunities for reducing the carbon footprint of our science without affecting fieldwork. And the benefits for getting this right are really high because research shows that public credibility in climate change science is improved by climate scientists living what they're talking about. And a friend of mine actually put this in a phrase which made me sort of take a little step back momentarily recently. We tend to think of the different emission scenarios uh, and the worst case scenario being business as usual. Business as usual to me enables us to disown this problem. We're not business. That inputs the, um, if you like, the fault on, you know, industry and commerce and so on. But their phrase was science as usual. Science as usual is the, a big part of this problem. And I think this problem goes hand in hand with our problems of, of equity, diversity and inclusion. And this is these two problems together, hand in hand, the reason that I'm so passionate about the IGS Global Seminar. So let's have a quick look at where, what we've done with this. So here is, um, we started as Helen mentioned in April 2020, 
uh, as soon as I got Wi-Fi and my home address after the first lockdown. And you can see this is just registrations during the first year. We've obviously um, restarted with a new link and we've already got 500 registrations on the new link. You'll know that it's live on Zoom. Here we are. It's uh, also live on Facebook and then we put it on YouTube. And it was really quickly obvious to me that there were huge benefits to the meeting, both for equality, uh, diversity and inclusion and climate change. And Helen, you can, uh, you can actually say something more about that uh, later. So uh, last summer we um, circulated a, um, a questionnaire and asked people about uh, people who were in the audience about who they were, what kind of um, background they came from. We asked them about the career stage. We asked them about what uh, different different types of um, sort of um, EDI characteristics. So whether people were carers, early career researchers, and so on and so forth, and how they were accessing the seminars. This was because I was really interested in what, how much the seminars could actually increase diversity. We also calculated the carbon dioxide we were saving by actually running the seminars as opposed to traveling to um, traveling to a meeting. And what I did was I took the locations that people reported that they uh, viewed seminars from and calculated for three hypothetical meeting locations what the carbon emissions of traveling to that meeting location would have been. And I can, I can talk to people about how you do that, but I made lots of assumptions in doing that, but it was just to get kind of a, a handle on how much carbon dioxide emissions we were saving by having virtual meetings rather than um, traveling to, um, to do so. And here are some results. Um, interestingly, People said that before, um, before the COVID lockdowns, they were typically attending one to two international meetings every year uh, and one to two national meetings each year as well. Um, and you can see um, for different locations what the carbon emissions saving by actually having a virtual seminar are. And I think the key take home message here is that wherever you hold these meetings, because of the international nature of, um, of our science, people are looking at something like between 20% and 30, sort of even up to 40% of a European mean carbon footprint, which is already higher than what is um, probably fair for our carbon footprint, but is actually lower, of course, than the US mean annual carbon footprint. So, we asked people what the IGS could do to reduce its environmental impact. And here are some of the answers that people gave. Um, and it's clear that people want hybrid meetings and virtual meetings, and they want the IGS to consider um, the environmental impact of things um, that, that we have to do, that would, um, or the environmental impact of scientific meetings. So some ideas there of what people want the IGS to do in terms of doing that. Um, and we also asked them how they saw the benefits of the seminar series. So these were free text comments. 15% um, of people said that the YouTube recording was really important to them. It partially gets over the time zone issues. It's impossible to have a seminar at a time that's convenient for everyone on the planet. Um, people mentioned that you can replay um, if you don't understand something or if you miss something, it's a minimal investment. You could have a look, watch for five minutes, decide if you're interested uh, and actually watch the whole of it if, if it is of interest to you. And people also said that they were pointing their students towards the seminars. So they were a great uh, educational resource. Surprisingly, 15% of people also used the word community uh, and talked about um, things to do with actually creating a community online. Um, an early career researcher mentioned how easy it was to network um, yeah, um, and how relaxed and comfortable the atmosphere of the meetings is. And diversity, quite a lot of comments also talked about why 
or how the um, IDF seminars support a greater diversity in our community. People talked about their caring responsibilities and how as a young one, one respondent mentioned as a young mother, they could come to the seminar. Um, people mentioned that they were free. Students could come to them without having to raise money. And there are certain geographic um, areas where it's harder to travel to seminars for, or um, to meetings from. So I think there was a, a feeling that there was a real benefit to, as it says here, hearing a broad range of voices from across the cryospheric community. Um, some benefits for the ITS is that it increases the visibility of the IGS on social media. This is uh, just a graph of uh, Facebook page members um, on the IGS um, Facebook page, and there's a clear inflection point um, when the seminars start. So just to summarize, um, it was really important, oops, those two come out together. Um, it was really important to people that they were both synchronous and asynchronous. So lots of people said that they wanted to come to the uh, live version because they wanted to be able to network with colleagues. Uh, but other people said that it was really important to them that they could have an asynchronous access to the seminars and watch them at times that were convenient to them. So the fact that we record them and put them on YouTube is really important to people. Um, people mentioned that they're informal, collaborative community building, and it's clear that we want both virtual and hybrid meetings, as well as face-to-face -face meetings. I think it's really clear that the current model of going to conferences is a model we have to break. It's clear that um, <laughs> you know, we cannot continue to go to one to two meetings each uh, every year. You know, the carbon um, that we uh, produce by doing so is just not reasonable for us to carry on doing so. So traveling, I think this has somehow got onto an, an automatic um, um, advance. It's, sorry about that. Um, but it really has to become unusual to fly to face-to-face -face meetings. Um, there's a huge advantage in equity, diversity, and inclusion terms to virtual attendance. It allows disadvantaged groups to attend the meetings. We've had a greater percentage of early career and female attendees at these seminars than is normal at IGS seminars. We've been able to have specific early career researcher slots. And as I said, I've been driving for a diversity of speakers, both in terms of gender and geography. Um, it's been great for the IGS online present. And even in 2022, almost two years after our first seminar, you're still here. So I assume that means that people like them and find them useful. So I'm going to finish there um, with advertising next week's seminar, which is by Samuel Cook uh, and is about modelling of West Greenland. So we should move over to questions and comments. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Tavi. Do we have any questions? Please feel free to raise your hand or um, questions or comments, discussion, or put your name in or put it in the chat um, so we can navigate. Uh, Andy, you have a question. Do you just want to unmute yourself? Yeah, perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you all to, for your interesting talks. I, I have a question to Tavi. If you have any suggestions uh, for early career scientists, I have noticed, and I have to admit, I did go to HU in person last fall. I really wanted to see all my wonderful colleagues again. And I have noticed that I was almost, you know, at the older end of the spectrum, and I've started talking to, to younger scientists, and most of them, or some of them brought up that, that a big, uh, big reason why they come to HU is look for a postdoc as a PhD student close to graduating or looking for a, a faculty position when you're a postdoc. And this seems something that is very, very hard to replicate in an online environment. 
so I'm wondering what we can do as IGS or maybe HU as well to provide an environment for early career scientists to replicate the face-to-face -face experiences that you can have at the conference. Yeah, I think that one's difficult. It's the coffee break, isn't it? That's uh, the hardest to uh, have virtually. We did have um, for a while in the seminars, and we could easily introduce them again, a sort of drop in early, uh, drop in early and chat um, session. Um, they worked very nicely for a while, and I, I, you know, some of those chats actually will remain with me in my mind forever. I remember we had one where we had an undergraduate, I think, from Manila. We had a couple of uh, professors from Australia. Um, and, you know, the discussion that was there really was free flowing, really was informal and it, and it was very nice. And, and the undergrad was talking about, you know, how, how she could um, go about getting, a, you know, into a, a postgrad position uh, in Australia. So I, I do think there are some ways and I think we have to be really innovative. We have to try things and we have to be prepared to fail and say that didn't work. Um, or we shouldn't do that as often, or whatever it is, but we have to try. I mean, I, I don't know who went to AGU virtually, but for me, I thought it was a disaster. <laughs> it was not a good experience. But I don't think we should knock them for trying, but I think we should knock them for charging as much as they did for trying and getting it wrong. <laughs> We have another question by Carolyn. Hi, I first just want to say thank you all for putting the time into creating these talks and to Tavi for organizing this series. I think it's been really great. Um, I wanted to ask a follow up question for Julia. Um, mostly I have kind of an open ended question about, you know, what were your lessons learned through this experience? Did you find you were able to better adapt to like issues that came up within the project teams or in the field um, or were there specific kind of recommendations or lessons learned for recruiting if you had a chance to kind of implement some practices for recruiting new students for the project um, any of the above <laughs> um that's a big set of questions and so i'm gonna try and i'm gonna go maybe in reverse order and say you just asked about um, what have we learned about recruiting new students? And I would say that's something we're looking at in the next year or two and is not something we have tackled much yet. Um, and two reasons for that, and of course not because it's not critically important, but two reasons because um, we just couldn't do everything at once. And also, hopefully with some good um, sensible planning, we're really trying to work on building a strong supportive community ourselves first before reaching out and telling a whole bunch of new people, hey, come join us. Um, we're trying to make ourselves welcoming and supportive first. Um, so other lessons learned, I think, you know, we have ebbed and flowed. We've been meeting, you know, 90 minutes every other week for two years. That's a lot of discussion time, a lot of time focusing on discussions. And I think we've learned from each other. Um, and some of our efforts have definitely failed. I mean, I, I want to be honest, we've um, not always made good progress. Some of our trainings have been eh you know, not that valuable. Maybe they would have been good for business people, but they weren't good for academics. And so maybe one broad lesson I can say is we've learned how personal such efforts have to be, how tailored. Um, we really do have to make all trainings um, or advice or, you know, documents really tailored to the specific group. It's meant for because you know an Antarctic field party needs a different lesson than an IBM office group or something um, I don't know hopefully that helps and um, hopefully that covered your question 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'd love to see more crowdsourcing in the long run of lessons learned specifically from field work, accessibility, and inclusion. I think there's kind of a wealth of knowledge distributed across the community that it can be hard to bring that together. Absolutely. And so if I, you know, hopefully it's clear, but our documents are publicly available online. And so if you go to the ITGC group, you can find our IDEA consortium and there should be links um, to our field norms and our community norms documents. And then we welcome comments back. Absolutely. Thank you. Nice, thank you. Do we have any more questions? If not, there is a discussion um, on the chat going on right now about Tavi asked whether or not uh, people have ideas about how we could um, improve or how um, the. It, it, that's really hard. How uh, basically following up on Andy's question, how we can improve networking for early career scientists as we would have it in the coffee break uh, during AGU or other meetings. Um, in case anyone has any idea, please feel free to unmute. Hester? Yeah, hi. I, I just had a general comment because one of the things that's that's happening quite recently is that there have been more women present, but to replace kind of middle-aged old white men with middle-aged old white women is not diversity, right? And then like even to think about like male and female, as Chris actually noticed in in the chat, is is like we, we have to think broader. And I I just asked Tavi if I could share my screen. I actually have kind of a list of like thinking broader about diversity and that also includes things specifically to us scientists so the research methods and the topics that we each you know cover and our like the background the academic background that we have that is also part of diversity and we're trying to capture that with you know including more ethnic diversity and geographic diversity but that is really important to like First of all, be inclusive about that and also not be discriminatory. You know, some people know math really well and some people don't. And it doesn't mean that, you know, one is, is more valuable than, than another one. So I don't know. Is it possible if I can share my screen to just summarize that? You can share your screen, Hester. So this is kind of a summary that I already had on my 2009 um, AGU poster, and this was then specifically for diversity amongst uh, editors with, within our field. But I think, I think usually what we talk about is, is kind of this part of, of the spectrum of diversity, but in terms of like, as a scientist, this like, who you collaborate with, you can otherwise have a really diverse group, but if you all come from the same academic background, it's still not really diverse enough. So I just want to point that out. The diversity is broader than kind of the human rights type of diversity within the field of science. Thanks. Thank you, Hester. Uh, Helen, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, well, it sort of follows up. It kind of follows up with what I said in the chat. Um, I know we've noticed that the diversity in this Zoom room is amazing. But if you think about it, that's not so amazing because that's actually, it's kind of switched. And so the point being, um, there are actually a lot of people who it would be great if they were here, but they're not here. And I understand that people watch on YouTube and people watch on Facebook. Um, but, you know, we need everybody to hear these conversations. So that I just wanted to make that point. And thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, okay, um, Tavi? Yes, yeah, so I, here's a challenge for, for, for me, for everyone. So um, one of the ways of getting 
people to be here um, if we feel they're not coming for some reason to seminars is to invite them to give a talk. So if anyone can think of anyone who is underrepresented in this room, either because, um, well, for any reason, and they can think of the person to ask, please let me know. I invite all the time people to give talks. Uh, I try and search out a diversity, but that is limited by my knowledge of the field. Uh, and um, that's why we've completely delegated the um, searching out early career researchers to the early career, career researchers themselves, because I don't have good knowledge of that. And the sea ice community have also stepped up and said that they would like more sea ice in these talks. Um, so we're handing over uh, recruiting sea ice talks to that community. So um, please say who you think is not represented here, either as a sort of, you know, who are we missing? Uh, you can describe them in some way, or even better, give me an email or a name and I'll invite them. Um, yeah, we can't drag people into the audience and just for these talks, but we can drag people to the seminars by um, inviting them to give talks. And we can even rig the thing by having some talks we think they should hear in the same session as the, the invited speaker. So we can get people here if we need to. Really good thought. Yes, let's get more people on board. Um, any more comments or discussions? I see there's lots going on in the chat. Yeah, I, I guess I'll just follow on from that. I said a very enthusiastic, yes. Um, some of you will remember the waste meeting, which was um, 2019, I think, in, in Julian. And we did exactly that, actually. And it was, it was Matt. Siegfried's idea and Brooke Medley and several others who have the idea that how do we get the people that we need in the room to have these discussions and it was put on right after the coffee break on the first day. And it was just called community discussion and what happened was we had this incredible conversation and all the people like if we just called it EDI training and had it in the evening we wouldn't have had everybody in the room, but we had them in the room because they were an audience and this is what we're doing as well with like faculty meetings for bystander training people hear it and they tune out they don't want to go but if you make them listen i mean this wasn't that bad an hour right it was pretty great so um we need everyone to realize that i agree completely they have to sneak it in everywhere i should say too that the these meetings are in themselves also create their own um, there are some parts of the world where you can't use Zoom. Um, there are some time zones for which this is not great for. Um, so, for example, one of the things I did this spring was to have a series of speakers from the Southern Hemisphere because the time zones in New Zealand and Australia are better when we're in winter and uh, we is here, me in Wales, here in winter and the Southern Hemisphere is in summer. So. Um, yeah, we can do some things, but there are countries where the time zone is horrific all the time. Um, so there are difficulties still. 